Welcome back, Torin. Hey, Sabby, how you doing? It's been a while. It has been a while, I know. I was just thinking that the other day, I was like, man, I have to circle back with some of the guests that I brought on like that first year mm -hmm. and, and bring people like back on. I've, I've been crazy, crazy busy. I don't know about yeah. you, but I've been busy. <laughs> oh, no, I've been busy. It's been a crazy, you know, a couple of years and everything with the pandemic and everybody trying to find their footing. So yeah, I get it. You know, a lot of people are coming back to what they normally do. So it's good to be here. Awesome. So my special guest tonight is Torin Walker. He is a journalist and a filmmaker. Torin, uh, welcome back. I know you've had a, a couple of projects that are going on. Uh, the first thing I want to show everybody is you actually were on a panel recently um, on, I think this was Ro Roland show. Oh, uh, you mean on Roland Martin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eric, if we can get that link up, the first one into the ready, because I want to show that clip. I want to show everybody this clip because this is something that we, I think we've talked about this a little bit at RBN. Nick, he lives in, in Kansas City, Missouri. So like you, he was present during like the Ferguson protest. Mm -hmm. And Nick has been telling people this for a while that a lot of the real on the ground activists just kind of either disappeared or they were arrested. You never heard from them again. And I think a lot of people want to give credit to the BLM uh, organization. They always point towards like Tamika Mallory and there's many criticisms there, but I want to play this clip for everybody of this panel from Roland's show, because you brought up a really good point here in reference to Black Lives Matter, the organization. I've been waiting to have this conversation for a while. Um, we're, we're nine years deep into this now. Um, ever since Ferguson started, um, there were brothers like Darren Seals and people who were on the ground who would call out some of these things and he got silenced. There were people who were close to the people who were connected to the ground who talked about these issues and he either got silenced or they either got marginalized or pushed completely out the way. Nobody said anything. And all of a sudden, after people in other cities have said this, they said, have said they had these conversations as well, again, nobody said anything. Nobody had anything to say until all of a sudden the story came out about $90 million and nobody said anything about, and people saw houses and mansions getting built. So my question is, what's happening now to make people so upset about the leadership that people weren't listening to nine years ago? And why is it, what, what's happening today? Sure, so we're actually, um... Uh, stepping into 10 years. Black Lives Matter was birthed July 13th, 2013, which is the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Dray Trayvon Martin. Um, so we've been doing this work. Um, people like me, who've been on the ground since day one, who were people who were in Ferguson, who were people who were in um, you know, Baltimore and Los Angeles and all of the plates, places that you saw uprising, right? Who were people who were just regular folks. Um, I'm just a mama. I'm a mama of three kids. I never took a check, right? Um, we've been saying things, but also I think more importantly, we view Black Lives Matter as a movement. Um, so I've been, um, less vocal about what's been happening inside of Black Lives Matter that I frankly have nothing to do with. I don't know about the, I do now, but at the moment, at the time, I didn't know anything about dollars coming in or about, um, you know, who's getting paid what. My concern and what I felt to be my sacred duty was to do work that makes the world safer for my children. And so when you're talking about people saying things, I think people were saying things, but more importantly, I think that the people, the boots on the ground were most concerned with doing something. Most Okay, uh, that, that, that piece there, first and foremost, do you think that that's true that she didn't know about the money that was coming in? I mean, I think a lot of us that weren't even a part of the organization knew about the money that was coming in. Yeah, you know, I can't really speculate on what she did and did not know. But what I can say is that if you just look at the record and you look at the history, she was very connected to the people who are supposed to know. Um, you know, there's video of her and Patrice Cullors and Alicia Garza, you know, being buddy, buddy and drinking champagne and eating cheese um, on the anniversary of George Floyd's death in the gigantic house that was bought with, um, I guess, I'm assuming money that came in off the back of George Floyd's death. So I don't know what she was privy to, but I know she was close enough to the people who were that that raises enough questions for me to ask. 
That's right. And I, I thought you brought up a really good point there about they had all this money coming into the organization. Like, why not use that money to help get some of the, the grassroots, like on the ground activists out of jail? Because this is the thing I think a lot of people just have not been aware of. The real like grassroots on the ground activists, some of these people were arrested. Some of them were pulled into vans and you never heard from them again. Like these are the people that you did not hear about. And I think Black Lives Matter just became like some type of brand. They were making like Cadillac commercials. And this is not to criticize the movement, so to speak. We're talking specifically about the organization. And it seems like it became this capitalist like organization that the Democratic Party, I feel in some way, shape or form infiltrated uh, this organization. Now, some of the activists told me that they felt like BLM was actually infiltrated from the very beginning. I don't know about that, but those activists that were arrested, the ones that have disappeared, they haven't been given any type of spotlight. Like they're not on the cover of magazines. I didn't see them in any type of Cadillac commercial. And I think it's just unfortunate because considering what happened to George Floyd and the mass movement of protests that we had across the world, this really could have elevated to something substantial and significant for people. And I felt like it just became a profit. And I want to get your opinion about that. Well, you know, there's three, there's, there's a couple of things that people have to understand. Um, there's the concept or the theory that Black Lives Matter, which is this concept and this theory that because you are Black in America and you have brown skin, you, your life, you deserve to live a life being free of being molested and being abused and being marginalized just because of your skin or killed by the police. That's what the concept of Black Lives Mattering means to the general public. Separate from that is the organization called Black Lives Matter, which is the group that was created on the backs of, you know, black people being killed by the police, institutionalized racism. That's the hard, basic thing that actually exists that people were able to donate to and see on the streets. Those are two separate concepts. But because they share a name, people assume the concept and the organization are the same thing. They are not. Um, the second thing is the idea that Black Lives Matter, the organization, was the sort of the conduit for the groundswell of mass movement that happened around the world. That's not true as well. The people who were originally pushing back against the police were poor and working class people who did not have an organization. This was what you saw was sort of like a groundswell of things that were happening all over the country, whether it was in Ferguson, Missouri, whether it was in Baton Rouge, whether it was in um, Kansas City, whether it was in Minneapolis. It just so happened that because Black Lives Matter, the organization had a branding that people latched onto, people assumed that all these different things were part of one uh, organization. But no, it was a movement of black people who were tired of having their backs pushed against the wall and institutionalized racism. Black Lives Matter, the organization was able to capitalize on that. And that's what I think people get confused. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm so glad you pointed that out, because I think one of the big criticisms was that B BLM bought like a five million dollar house. That was a big thing. And I, I, for me, I was just sitting back thinking to myself, like, really, like, that's what you did with all that money like that you raised? Like, why not take that money and put it back into the community? Like, why not, like, invest that money into alternative programs to policing. So I, I don't know about you, but for me, I just, I, I do approve of defunding the police. I know like it's a big like issue that a lot of people are just like, oh, don't want to touch that. But I do agree with defunding the police and creating some type of alternative programs instead. There have already been cities, at least on the local level that have done that. They actually have created mental health programs instead of sending a police officer out to someone that has like a mental health issue, they're sending a mental health uh, counselor, someone who knows how to deal with that. So there are different ways that this can be done, but I feel like because of what happened with Black Lives Matter, the organization, because of the profit motive, I feel like it kind of created like a bad, a bad name for the movement that happened on the ground. Yeah, and that's the real tragedy of all this because there are people who are legitimate activists who are doing this work and risking their lives and also coming up with really good grassroots based solutions to try to push back against, you know, institutionalized racism in policing and the and, and in the United States. 
The problem is because of the name that that, that organization is generated and the amorphous sort of like indecisiveness of that organization, what it's done is push people who may want to help away because they don't understand the difference between an organization and a movement and they don't want to get themselves involved in it because they don't first of all they don't want to feel like they've been played and second of all because so many that organization has sucked up so much oxygen around this these ideas that nobody wants to touch them because first of all they haven't been straightforward with the people on the ground who are part of their organization and they haven't been straightforward with the public at least their quote-unquote leadership has you know and that's the problem and that's the tragedy on all this that's right and i don't know if you saw this but this actually came out recently uh this was from newsweek and they said Black Lives Matter finances hits hit as donations fall. Uh, it says that um, Black Lives Matter finances suffered a blow after the nonprofit ran an 8.5 million deficit last year as donations uh, fell. Um, I think we can we can assume why the donations uh, fell, but this was like a big a, a huge profit in the sense that like. There were movie deals that were supposedly in place for Tamika Mallory. And I'm just like, there's one person or two people that are obviously like making a huge profit off of this. Like you're getting like Hollywood deals. I heard those deals from Tamika Mallory have now been canceled because she hasn't produced the content that they asked her to produce. And then it's just like the people are still being killed on the streets by police. And that's the thing that frustrates me. Everybody talked about George Floyd when it happened. Everybody, independent media covered it at some some form or another. Some covered it more than others. But then it was like after that torn, it just stopped. And people were still being killed by the police, like unarmed people still being killed by the police. So it's like, I, I kind of looked around and I'm like, really? No, people aren't covering this story about this, this 11 year old boy who was killed by the police. Uh, it's just very frustrating. And I feel like even when it came to the media spaces, it seemed like people talked about it at that time because it was beneficial for their platform. Yet police brutality is still continue to happen. And now I hear people don't even talk about the other stories that are more recent. Yeah, um, I do want to say one thing. Um, I think you're talking about Patrice Cullors. Patrice Cullors was the one who had a deal, I think with Warner Brothers and they canceled the deal, I think a couple of weeks ago from what, according to the news reports, because she hadn't produced any content. That's, that's, right. that's, who, was, that's who had the deal at Warner Brothers, I believe. So, you know, I think she got, it's almost like a rapper getting dropped from a label, ironically. Um, you know, as far as the stories that are going on, as you said, if you have that much money coming in and donations, my question is, how come you have not set up a media arm that ha automatically goes to these stories every time these sorts of things happen? Um, that's more than enough money for a camera crew to fly out somewhere and tell these stories. That's more than enough money to set up your own media company or media wing of your organization to stay on these stories. Because as we both know, you know, the media is going to be what the media is going to be. You know, they have a very short shelf life. This news cycle moves from one thing to the other. They don't have any sort of or sort of moral center, at least mainstream media. And it's up to the people who really are passionate about these stories to keep these things in front of the public, you know, when the news mainstream media moves away, you know, it was George Floyd in 2020, you know, it was whether it was climate crisis in 2021, it was the Ukraine in 2022 and 2023, the media moves the way they want to move. So if you're bringing in this sort of money, why don't you have people who are dedicated to telling these stories? How come you're not funding journalists to be able to go out to say these things? You know what I mean? Because obviously you have enough. And if you have connections in Hollywood, why, why, how come you don't have liaisons in that industry to be able to tell these stories even further? So I don't know. It's it's very it's very strange, and it's very odd that this all all these resources are coming in, but nothing's being built. When you have organizations like the Panthers who are able to build nationwide um, programs and do a breakfast program and do trainings and go to people's houses and educate people with a whole lot less and the government on their back, so it's very it's very suspect. That's right. I mean, they could have had citizen journalists on the ground and different like cities covering these stories. I mean, I just saw recently there is uh, a gentleman. I think I think he's a right wing, but there's a gentleman. His name James O'Keefe. He started this this company where he's just basically hired all these people to be citizen journalists and go out on the street and expose corruption. I mean, they had all that money coming in. It's like they could have done the same thing. And I don't know if you noticed this, but now I've noticed police brutality cases aren't covered as much in mainstream media or they're not covered for long. Like they may cover it like the first day and then they just move on to another story. Whereas George Floyd, that incident was talked about daily, I felt like.
Mm -hmm. I think part of that as well was um, the situation George Floyd's murder happened during the pandemic where a lot of people were home and inside. So it was able to catch everybody's imagination. And there was the fact that there was that horrific video that everybody saw. So it was sort of like a culmination of everything we saw over the past four to five years leading up to that point. And the sad thing about this is the murder of George Floyd was the first time you had a worldwide movement and worldwide outrage uh, about the plight of black people in America in the hands of racist policing. And everybody around the world was almost on one accord about this is horrific and this needs to stop. There was momentum there that could have been moved into legislation. There was momentum that could have been moved into actual hard, you know, le legislation and ad administrative practices that could have really transformed policing in this country. And I feel like that moment was lost because people got caught up, as you said, in the profit motive and people got blinded by cameras and it became more of a thing where what happens is neoliberal media will often co-opt your movement and make it palatable for the masses with no real change happening. And I think that's what happened. And I think that's what happened with a lot of people in that organization, unfortunately, and it's just sad. Yeah, I agree. Another thing that I noticed too, because this kind of leads me into what's happening right now with Cop City. And I don't know if everyone's been paying attention to this. If you have not, you definitely need to. There's new news coming out about Cop City every day. And Steve Dotzinger actually tweeted this out earlier. In the dead of night, Atlanta City Council voted 11 to 4 to approve $67 million for a police training center that will be an incubator for the criminalization of protests and attack on low-income communities. Pure cowardice. And what's interesting about this is when you look at the people who voted, what kind of made me cringe is that you have black politicians who voted yes. Some of them voted no, but some of them voted yes. And so for people who are not aware, there were people, activists actually protesting um, in Atlanta in reference to uh, Cop City. This has been going on for a while, but just yesterday they were protesting, trying to get these officials to at least talk to them. They wouldn't even speak to them. So they were there for like hours. And then this is like the, 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 the end result. And when I connect this with BLM, I just feel like, the way like the George Floyd movement took hold of the national landscape, I really do feel like if there had been some tangibles like in reference to legislation on a national level, something like Cop City may have been prevented. What's your take on that? You know, um, I'm in Atlanta and I think people had this idea of Atlanta as this black Mecca and the quote unquote city too busy to hate. And that's true in some respects, but the flip side of that is that that means that city is sometimes too bitty to stand up to its moral history and to its legacy. Atlanta is one of the cities with some of the highest in income inequalities in the country. And unfortunately, the majority of that income inequality is um, at, on the backs of black, poor black people. The people who are on the advertising of Atlanta, the people who you see in the suits, the people, you know, the television, the people you see on TV shows and in the media, that's completely removed from the real life, um, daily lives of black people who live in this city. Um, this is not surprising. Uh, people who are at city hall, people who are in the, you know, at the, in the state government, they may be black, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they follow in the legacy of like an Andrew Young or a Maynard Jackson, people who had the best interests of the black citizens of, of Atlanta at heart while still dealing with the power structure here. A lot of people here basically surrender their moral um, integrity to the power structure here in the status quo, and they will fight to maintain their power at any cost, at the cost of anybody's life, at the cost of the poor black people in Atlanta's lives. And that's just a hard fact. They may look good and they trade on the legacy of Dr. King and all this stuff, like I said, but they don't really believe in that. They believe in staying in power. And unfortunately, we have black people who are more than willing to facilitate that. That's, That's all you right. can say about that and it's sad. That's right. And Cop City is also, it's backed by corporations. It's backed by businesses. Coca-Cola backs Cop City. Banks are backing Cop City. And so like there's there's corporate corporate profit to be made here as well. And what's really, I think, frustrating in reference to this, there was an activist, I covered this a while ago, that was killed by the police. He was protesting against Cop City. This was earlier on. Uh, the police said that he shot at them. Now, he was a climate activist. And I found that to be very odd. I'm like, when have climate activists shown up to protest with guns? That's usually not their thing. And so now there's more information coming out about that, that maybe the police were not truthful. Go figure. But I feel like Cop City should be a warning sign to everyone, even if you don't live in Atlanta, because this could happen in your city, too. 
maybe Atlanta is just the start of it. And I think they're trying to prevent more mass protests from, from rising up like we have with George Floyd. No, I think that's true. And unfortunately, I think it's there. It's a very excellent. It's an excellent climate for that to happen, because, as we said earlier, you know, the public um, attention span is very short. If you don't have people constantly on these stories and telling people what's going on and informing them, these sort of things happen, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, in the dark of night, you know, because if there's no media coverage, if people aren't being informed of this, if there's no video about this, like even if you go back to protests up until after George Floyd, there was always somebody with a camera or a cell phone taking pictures of what was going on and videotaping this. And you had media um, coverage of this. You don't even see that anymore. And tying it to your point earlier, I think some of the situation that happened with BLM is a part of this because I think there's some media burnout. And I also think there's some media frustration that people who green light these stories because there was no real movement on these stories when it was a national story for like sustained amounts of time for almost a year. And um, I don't want to lay that at the feet of that organization, but I do believe that the fact that there was so little pushback and people are seeing all this effort that they put into the idea of BLM falling by the wayside and basically going the line of the people outside of any real movement. I think that's got a chilling effect. And again, that's tragic. Torn, where is the mayor on this? Because for people who are not aware, like Torn was saying, like people do often think of Atlanta as like a black Mecca. Atlanta is very different from the very first time I visited Atlanta years ago. Uh, people have to understand like Atlanta is not the same Atlanta that it was like in the nineties where everybody let's move to Atlanta because R&B groups were starting there, like TLC and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's not the same anymore. There's gentrification happening in Atlanta, just like a lot of other cities. Uh, Buckhead, I've been to Buckhead once. Buckhead is expensive, uh, in, in my opinion. I also saw there was some type of legislation being mentioned to separate Buckhead from the rest of Atlanta. Like, it just, for me, it's just... I think people need to understand that just because this is a city where the population may be predominantly black, although I think that is changing, and you do have a black mayor, where does where did they stand on this issue with Cop City? You would think they would want to protect or go along with what's going to protect the community. Atlanta is um, Atlanta has black leadership in name only. Um, real estate developers really run Atlanta. Um, CEOs really run Atlanta. As far as the mayor, um, Andre Dickens, I think what he's trying to do, and this is just my speculation, I feel like what he's trying to do is be on both sides of the fence. And what I mean by that is he's a black man. He represents sort of like that image of the black mayor in charge of a black city. And as long as he can keep that image out in front of the public outside of the city, he'll be just fine. Inside the city, I think most people feel like he is, how can, how, how can I say this? I think they feel like he is basically there to rubber stamp a lot of things that go on in the city without offering any sort of real critique and any real pushback. He's been on a couple of uh, public forums where he's taken some criticism, but there hasn't been any real hard movement from his office on his end about a lot of this stuff. He keeps a lot of things, I think, close to the vest until they're done and then he gets in front of them. But he's sort of like the tradition of the mayors that we've had up until, um, uh, who was it? Who was here before? When Freaknik was here, when um, Bill Campbell was here. He sort of started out this trend of the sort of like the corporate mayor where like he has the right imagery. He looks good. He goes out and waves at people. But then he goes back just to doing rubber stamps, things that aren't beneficial to the black population of Atlanta. And that's how it's been ever since like the mid 90s. This is not the Atlanta people recognize. This is very much a gentrified um, corporate um, corporate focused city. And the few people, the few black people who can benefit from that are doing just fine. Everybody else is just trying to get through day to day. And you don't see that a lot. So it's not what you think it is. And Atlanta was one of the cities where there were protests for George Floyd. Um, and there were actually people who are, I guess, quote unquote, like celebrities that participated in those protests as well um, in Atlanta. So for me, it's just it's it's really frustrating. I think one of the, the big things that really bothered me is when someone says to me, well, we had the protest for George Floyd, but there were no demands. I had this conversation re recently with Norm Finkelstein, and I said, that's not true. The demand was to defund the police. And you guys, he was like, well, I don't like the phrase. And da -da -da. I was like, yeah, but there was a demand there. And I know it didn't happen on the national level, but in some of the local communities, there were some changes that were implemented in reference to, to policing. One of the big things people have said is that they felt like the phrasing, the phrase defund the police wasn't the right phrase. Like it scared people and made them think, oh, we're not going to have police at all anymore. 
What do you think about that? Because I was told that the reason why that phrase was chosen was so that it would not be co-opted. You know, on the one hand, I agree with that. Um, defund the police is a very um, direct statement. I think what they did, I think the people who crafted that message fell down in is they did not do a good job in explaining what they meant by that. Um, you know, you can take a phrase, there's a phrase called language capture where a phrase can be sort of like inert and have a sort of like a neutral meaning. And what you invest into that phrase um, turns into whatever you want that phrase to mean. Defund the police, I think it does scare people who are not connected to um, black movements and just um, movement work. It sounds really good on paper and it sounds real good in the street. But then when you have to take that into negotiating, you have to actually make that phrase mean what you want it to mean. And I do agree that in different cities, defunding the police means different things. And because there was so little oxygen given to um, what that phrase meant, I think that what that meant was people who were enemies of that phrase and enemies of the whole idea were able to take that message and make it mean what they wanted it to mean. You know, all it really means is basically taking away some of the military hardware and some of the paramilitary uh, police policies that happened and when you, that we saw in the, in the Black Lives Matter and also a little bit to a lesser extent in Ferguson. Um, I don't have a problem with the phrase. I think that what happened was there was no real unified meaning of what that meant. And the people who crafted that message, like I said, again, did not do a good job of getting on the press and telling people what that meant by defunding the police and giving examples of how you can have better policing by not having this armed paramilitary, you know, this almost like quasi fascist idea of what policing looks like. And I think that's where it held. That's where it fell down at. In my how opinion. do you think people feel in Atlanta knowing that it, it looks like Cop City is going to proceed? How do you think people feel? in Atlanta, particularly black people in Atlanta, like for me, I wouldn't feel safe. Um, unfortunately, I think the majority of black people in Atlanta are going to forget about this within a couple of days. Um, the people who keep these, the people who agitate and the people who keep these social issues in front of the public, they're always a very small group of people. And if you don't have constant messaging outside of your group of people who believe like you do to get this out into the public, the public is going to keep on doing what they're doing. They're going to worry about going to work. They're going to worry about their everyday lives. And they're not going to go think any further than that. That's just the nature of human beings. And until you, unless you have qualified messaging that constantly hammers in the dangers of what can go on if you allow these things to continue and if you allow them to grow in other cities, the people aren't going to really understand what's going on. And they're not going to get energized and activated until it's too late. And I hate to say it that way, but that's just a hard truth. You've got to have consistent messaging outside of a slogan. If you ride around the city, you'll see those slogans of Stop Cop City everywhere. But mm -hmm. I don't think there's enough education to the people to tell them exactly what that means. It's just another slogan like Black Lives Matter or it's another slogan that looks good. But if you don't educate the people again and get people understanding the urgency of trying, trying to stop this, nothing's going to really move. And I think it may be a little bit too late for the city of Atlanta. I hate to be pessimistic, but this is just how I feel. Do you feel like we're moving towards a militarized police state? I think we're already in a militarized police state. We're just waiting for something to happen to, to, to make it official. And I think that's nationwide. I think we had a moment where you could have pushed back on it in 2020 when people around the world saw the situation, how people reacted to George Floyd, to the protests against George, uh, um, the protests with George Floyd. But I think that moment might have been lost. I think that because of, again, some of the missteps with this organization, it, the, the idea of pushing back against militarized police lost a lot of momentum. And there hasn't been anything to take its place to keep that momentum going because there's been so much infighting within that organization. And there hasn't been any other um, groups to be able to coalesce and take over that mantle and push back and say, we stand for this and this is what we want. So I'll, I, I don't want to be completely pessimistic about it, but right now it doesn't look good. You know what I mean? I feel like if something has to happen and somebody has to, with integrity has to step in front of these things and say that this is what we stand for and this is what we want to see move. Torn, have you seen any of the the celebrities in Atlanta? Because for those who don't know, there are a lot of celebrities that live in Atlanta. Maybe some like from the music industry, or there are also some from reality TV. There's movie stars who live in Atlanta. Have you seen any of them get out in front of this issue with Cop City? Like, for example, is Usher involved in this? Is anyone from, I know uh, uh, Portia from Real Housewives of Atlanta, for people who don't know, she actually comes from a family of activists like her grandfather walked with dr king like it's it's a really big deal like in her family have any of them joined this effort to stop cop city not that i've seen um the only person really who's been active in things that i have actually seen is killer mike 
I've seen Killer Mike show up to um, things that where the cameras aren't there, where there's people, you know, trying to do city council meetings or having town halls and that sort of stuff. But as far as celebrities, I think the momentum on celebrities getting into activism pretty much paid, died out with the George Floyd thing. And especially in going back to what you said earlier, I think the situation with the Black Lives Matter organization has made a lot of celebrities very wary of dipping into situations like this because they don't know who is who and they don't know who to trust. And a lot of these celebrities get information handed to them. And if they're not connected to what's going on, I think they don't want to risk any of their reputation to be seen out front on anything. If something happens where more celebrities start getting active in this, you'll see celebrities show, show up again. Wherever there's a camera and it looks good, celebrities will show up. But right now, no. That's a good point. Um, the Democratic Party. Now, obviously, Joe Biden was able to win the state of Georgia. There was a strong focus there on the suburban white neighborhoods uh, outside of Atlanta um, that I guess really brought it home for him. What are you hearing from people now? And I asked that question because Joe Biden said that he was going to relieve like student loan debt for students that went to, went to HBCUs. He said this in Atlanta at HBCUs. How are people feeling, particular Afri African Americans in the Atlanta area about Joe Biden for 2024? Well, the answer that you have to understand that in Atlanta, there's several different stratas of black voters. You have the traditional black voter that the Democratic base um, caters to, which is like, you know, 50, 55 and up. The people who sort of grew up with the civil rights movement and had those stories and they understand the, the importance of voting. Those are the people who are all going to going to be all the way in for Biden because they can be easily um, appealed to with the history of Martin Luther King. And they can easily pull out the, you know, the old black and white photos of the police dogs biting people and the students getting rolled down the street with um, fire hoses and everything. That messaging works for them. You have the upper middle class to middle class voters who aren't really vocal about politics, but they're gonna vote with their wallets. And if it's advantageous to them to vote Democratic because it's good for their business, they'll vote Democratic. If it's advantageous for them to vote Republican because it helps for their business and their taxes, they'll vote Republican. They just won't talk about it in dinner parties and things like that. You also have the strata of voter from 18 to maybe like 30, 34, who I think are very disillusioned with the Democratic Party because they're the ones who went all in for, for the Obama years and they saw how that benefited some people and didn't benefit others. They went reluctantly into the Clinton years. And then a lot of people don't like Clinton because of her history, you know, with black voters. They didn't like Biden at all because they know the crime bill. And a lot of people I know for a fact did not vote for Biden because of the crime bill. And they didn't vote for Kamala because of her record in California. And a lot of them got browbeaten into voting, but they quietly sat home. So I'm saying, I think there's three different stratas of voter in, uh, in Atlanta who feel a certain way about the Democratic Party in 2024. But I'll tell you right now, a lot of black voters are not going to vote for Joe Biden. They're just frustrated. They're tired of the messaging that they got in 2020, where it was like, you know, if, you're not, if you don't vote for Joe Biden, you're not black. Or they're tired of a lot of the browbeating by a lot of corporate people and a lot of corporate shills and a lot of Democratic shills who tell them you, you're, you're weak or you're stupid if you don't vote for Biden. That might have worked in 2020, but it put a lot of bad taste in people's mouths. And now that we've had four years of seeing what's going on, they're not going to go for it. It's going to be a battle between like the traditional black voter that the Democratic Party caters to and the disillusioned, pissed off and disaffected black voter who's a lot younger. So it's going to be a battle in Atlanta, I think, this time. It's not going to work like it did in 2020. Yeah, I think that things are going to be different this time around. And that brings me into Cornel West. I'm sure, as you know, Cornel West's recent announcement that he's running for president with the People's Party outside of the duopoly. Uh, I look at someone like Cornel West. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the show, but I look at someone like Cornel West as beloved among people of all demographics and all different ages, older people like Cornell West, young people like Cornell West. Like, and so I think, and for me, I was just like, wow. Like I was, I was really surprised because I asked him if he would ever be interested in running before, but I was really surprised that he's going forward with that and he's going to run outside the duopoly. What, what do you think about that? What do you think about Cornell West uh, dipping his toe into into the sand, so to speak. And and how do you feel about him running with the People's Party? Because I know some people are are not too happy about that. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm elated that Cornell West is running. And anything that breaks up this duopoly that we have in America when it comes to political action and political parties, I'm for it. I think he has probably the best chance of creating a groundswell since Bernie, I believe, because just because of name recognition. And I think he's very, very good on, you know, obviously he's very good at public speaking. So it's going to be interesting to see him on the stump. You know what I mean? 
now political political campaigning is a lot different than academic um academic speaking but i think he has enough pull to be able to pull that off now as far as what's going to happen i think what's going to happen and i've already seen some of this some of his most viral detractors are going to come from the democratic side because when it comes to black voters the people who are and i like to call them the negro whispers these are the people who the democratic party sends out to talk to black voters nothing scares them more than the idea of somebody outside of their circle getting the ear of the black voter because they're so entrenched in the democratic party and they're so um they're so viral, rabid about keeping their position that anything that threatens that they're going to fight tooth and nail that's going to be fun to see because you're going to see a lot of skin folk come out and be violently against this man and pull out things from the net from 20 years ago that they don't agree with and they're going to attack this man like i said i'm going to put some things up maybe later on that i've already seen happening now i think what's going to happen he's going to pull away a lot of true progressives and independent voters who vote for the democratic party because they don't have any other option they're going to, he's going to move them away from the democratic establishment and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out and it's going to be interesting what kind of platform he stands on when he gets out there on the stump now as far as the people's party i'm well aware that there's issues with the people's party and their leadership um but in my opinion and this is just my opinion those issues while they are real serious issues they do need to be addressed and they need to be addressed quickly they're nowhere near as serious as the issues that the democratic establishment and the republican establishment has been able to perpetrate in this country for the past 50 years in my opinion so i think it's just instead of playing the lesser two evils maybe we need to think about maybe fixing some things in the third option and go from there because there's no clean there's no perfectly clean party in this country but i feel like the the party that has the pop the possibility to become a third way that could be built on and can be adjusted and can be changed may be the way to go and maybe an option for black voters in america well said well said Quar. i think like one of the things that was really interesting to me was the race between herschel walker and um i always forget his name warnock, Raphael warnock. Yeah. yeah and i remember watching that live and just thinking to myself like it, it, for warnock to even be the incumbent the fact that it was even that close like that was that was crazy to me it, what did you hear from people in reference to that i was like you shouldn't even be this close to herschel walker that i think that should be a big wake-up call for democrats yeah that's pretty much what i heard from a lot of people in atlanta and georgia it was like how can Herschel Walker even get to be a contender to be even get close to her to uh, Raphael Warnock to be able to even get on the debate stage that I don't I, here's the thing I think it's not that was not so much a referendum on Raphael Warnock I think it was more uh truth of the fact that the Republicans go all out for whoever they back the Republicans right or wrong good or bad whether it's a good candidate or whether it's a bad candidate and I do believe Herschel Walker was a bad candidate but if Herschel Walker had the possibility to unseat Raphael Warnock, no matter how horrible he was on the podium, no matter how much potential damage he may be having from his football career, they're going to back him 100 percent and they're going to push him because the Republicans believe in winning. They don't care who you run. As long as you have the potential of winning, they will put all their resources, all their money behind you. And he had nonstop campaigning in, a, in, a, in the city of Atlanta and in Georgia. There were like um constant uh, television ads there were mailers going out every single day about um Herschel Walker because first of all he had serious name recognition in Atlanta because he was a football player and this is the south and being a football player in the south is almost like being like one of um Jesus's disciples people will follow you no matter what you say that's just the culture here and they knew how to work the culture the Democrats unfortunately what happens in Georgia is they bring in a lot of consultants from outside the state and they let them craft the messaging that doesn't resonate with the people in the state and that's how come you have so many people who lose a lot of times who are really good um, candidates in georgia so i think that's what that was it's just the fact that the republicans back their people no matter what the democrats look for perfect people and that's where they fall down why do you think stacy abrams lost do you think it's true that I, I don't believe this is true but she said that black men didn't come out and support her uh that's not what the polls showed uh based on what i saw but why do you think people didn't come out and uh heavily support stacy abrams I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, first of all, that is a lie. No, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't black men. The people who said that were people who were in academia who were trying to basically lick their wounds because they didn't want to deal with the truth. Um, when Stacey was running, I had a conversation with one of her consultants, who ironically was from outside of the state. The reason Stacey did not win, or the way, reason she lost as bad as she did, is because her campaign people put all her focus on the people who already she had a lock on. And I'm talking about the white gentrifying people 
who already lived in gentrified parts of Atlanta, who already had Stacey Abrams signs already on their on their um, on their lawns. She put all her focus on them. What Stacey did not do was she did not take her campaign to the street. Stacey did one thing that was really good when she launched her campaign, her second campaign. She did a black men's um, meet and greet and an issue um, form at Fellowship, which is um, Cam Newton's cigar bar in Castleberry Hill in downtown. A lot of prominent black men meet there on the weekends to talk, chop up the issues and just smoke a cigar. I thought that was really good messaging. But what she did not do, she did not take her message to the um, black barbershops. She did not take her issues to the black churches. She did not take her issues to the hair salons. She focused on the well-off middle class white people who she already had a lock on. Black people in Atlanta did not know who she was. They knew her name, but they did not know her. For people to be on your side in Atlanta, you got to physically put your feet on the street and go talk to people. If that means going out on the block, if that means going to the hood, if that means going to the churches, you got to do that. And she did not do that. She kept so focused on the gentrifiers and the and the people who already she had 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 her who basically were in her corner that nobody else felt like they needed to do anything. You got to motivate people to go out and vote for you. And if you don't talk to black people on the ground in Atlanta, you're not going to win. And that's what happened. People from outside, people from outside of the city told her how to move. And you saw the result. And I told people on her campaign, do not do this. And did they listen to me? Nope. And what, what happened? Who's the, who's the governor? Mm -mm -mm. I'll take that comment on Rockfin, Eric, real quick. There is a, a comment here. I think it's from, from Roger Meadows. Yeah. Thank you so much for the tip, uh, Roger. The enemy is saying mission accomplished. Also, Atlanta is not only the capital of Georgia, but it is it is also the county seat of Fulton County with a small section extending into DeKalb County. Understand, although Georgia may not be a citizen ballot initiative state, Fulton and DeKalb County allow for local ballot measures so that the voters of those counties can pass a law that says no more cop city. That's that's a good point, uh, Roger. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, one more thing I wanted to uh, pick your brain about, Torn. I've been asking people that have been coming on lately who have been independent journalists or commentators uh, about advice for people who are interested in pursuing that path, uh, considering there's more there's more censorship now. <laughs> Every time I turn around, someone's being like demonetized or taken off a platform, et cetera. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about doing uh, independent journalism today? Well, um, I don't normally like to give advice, but I will say this. The one thing I will say is that going into this sort of thing, it's not going to be easy. Um, build, find your people and build your audience and be sure that you have an audience that's willing to help fund what you do because it takes money to do something like this on a daily basis. It takes money to keep these things generating. A lot of journalists don't like to talk about that independent journalist, but you're always gonna have your back against the wall if you're not tied to a corporate sponsor or if you're not tied to people who really believe in what you do. Just understand you have to start this from a labor of love and a love of informing the people and understand that you're gonna have some hard days, but the rewards are gonna be much, much, um, better at the end of the day and you're going to be able to look yourself in the mirror and be able to tell yourself that you inform the people so as far as advice just be sure you have everything lined up and don't be afraid to ask your people to support what you do they will eventually come it's not going to be easy but they will come and don't portray those people who put their faith in you well said torn before you go where can people find you you can find me online at um, tornwalker.com. That's my website. You can find me on social media, Twitter at, uh, at tornwalker.com. I'm on TikTok, believe it or not, at tornwalker.com. I mean, at tornwalker, my IG, pretty much all my stuff is tornwalker, T-O-R-R-A-I-N-E-W-A-L-K-E-R. You put those in, all my stuff comes up. Fortunately, nobody else has my name and I have it copywritten, so you're good there. Awesome. A lot of people don't know this if you're a newbie, but Torn was one of my first guests that came on when I started this show first guess so well that's right i, I was even, yeah yeah i didn't even have a mic <laughs> i didn't even have an external mic back then so yeah i see you doing your thing and you're getting some very good people on your show so much love to what you're doing i see you and respect thank you so much thanks so much for coming on touring my pleasure sir all right guys Hope you learned something there from Torin. Follow Torin on uh, Twitter. He's always on Twitter. Follow him on his socials. Follow, follow his website. He does really good work. Um, and I would like to see him uh, on more people's shows as well. Like Torin does really good work.